Welcome everyone to a new episode of Straightforward. I'm very excited today to be here with Amanda Skura, which is a long-term friend and a global executive in the digital transformation space. We worked with her for many years and uh, we'll be discussing here today, you know, how to come from a project-based organization to a product-led organization, which is a, a very timely topic. So Amanda, welcome to the show. Uh, why don't you kind of uh, intro yourself and, and tell us a little bit about, you know, how you're, how uh, you're passionate about this topic. Sure. Um, so my name is Amanda and yes, I've worked with CINT for a number of years. They are my favorite partner and they didn't even tell me I had to say that, but <laughs> um, my background really evolved from project to product almost 20 years ago. And kind of that migration and kind of moving into that mindset, I felt like was so powerful at such a, you know, early stage in my career. And then I was really lucky enough to be part of three organizations that went through that transition, right? And it really proves that there are still organizations kind of making the switch over that 20 years. And you certainly have those companies out in front, but it's definitely kind of an evolving discipline and it's really not completely grasped the same way across uh, the places where I had worked. And so, you know, former Marriott and former Audi digital team member, you know, being able to kind of be at the forefront of the innovation within, especially at Audi within the vehicle, but then really being able to apply like, how do we work and how do we start to work differently so that we can really accelerate that innovation and that work, but with a focus on the customer and what that customer experience looks like. Well, re really appreciate you. You, you already kind of introduced, in, uh, uh, I guess, the the why too much great, right? So we, we see a lot of people kind of just sometimes jumping into the bandwagon there without clarity why why to do this transformation, right? So in a, as, uh, that, as we see, we, we you did it at Audi and other organizations. Yeah, I can remember that agility, that. right? That that respond, oh, kind of being able to respond. If correct me if I'm wrong, but it, well, yeah. the motivation was kind of a, being able to give the teams autonomy to actually respond faster to to customer needs and customer new behaviors, right? Yeah, I always remember asking these questions when I kind of was an assistant and then a project manager, of like, well, what's next? Like, where does this thing go? And they're like, well, the funding is done, and then that's the end of it. And we wait for new funding, and then we submit. And that start-stop model, like, it was so confusing. It really goes back to my childhood. I was so curious, like, one million questions. I'm sure my parents think it's funny now, but probably not. But <laughs> where I just wanted to know everything about something. Like, what is this? Like, where did it come from? Like, where does it go? Like, how does this work? Like, how do you build it? And I think that curiosity really kind of fed kind of a natural progression for me of, like, this thing shouldn't just be done. Right. I started in more of a kind of marketing capacity and, you know, I haven't been working that long, but digital wasn't even a thing. And all of a sudden, right, it was like everyone was moving to digital as fast as you could. Like that had to be kind of your mentality. And I remember kind of perfectly aligning with the questions people were asking and kind of really had on the job training, but because it was moving so fast, you kind of had to figure it out. And I think at first it wasn't necessarily a structured, we're moving from this to this, but that's what it became. And really looking at it as, wow, we really shifted how we're working. And then realizing as I moved on in my career, like I maybe would take a step backwards because that organization maybe wasn't quite as far on the maturity lens within, you know, that working model or within, you know, putting digital and customers kind of at their forefront, um, more so on, you know, what are our company priorities? What are we trying to deliver as an organization, but really not adding quite that lens of how do I help my customer? And by helping my customer, I'll bring more to my bottom line, right? Of course, you, you connect those dots, but it wasn't a given at that point in time. Yeah, would you say that that's that's the the main prerequisite to kind of a someone and kind of a, a company organization willing to to go this journey? Is this, is the understanding that they do the main change in the end of the day is that they have to kind of elevate 
their customers' needs to to the at least at the same level their that their own organizational need. Like uh, we will increase yeah. revenue and profitability, but if, how to kind of respect the customer needs that they'll at least balance them all in the same kind of a level there. Yeah, and I think you know the in the organizations that I've been in, right? The focus really started on we need to think about our customer differently. We need to start looking at data. Right? How do we start to learn more about what our customers are doing on our website, but also what they want? I think that, though, when you are maybe more skilled in, okay, but how do you do that, Right, really starts to pair itself with a move and a shift to product development and agile delivery. But I think what the initial catalyst is, is the request to be more customer focused. When you take it one level down for anyone who's maybe more in the change management space or in that, you know, actually delivery spot in the organization, you can't keep working the same way in development and design and really kind of that the data analytics and expect to be more, be more customer led. So for me, it's really a pairing of the two, but I find that the executive level is typically asking for a focus on the customer. It's then, you know, one level down, it's our job to really say, okay, but to do that, here's what it's going to take. Are we really bought in? Because I think it's very easy to say, I want to focus on my customer. I think the hard part is actually changing the mindset and the culture to be customer-led and lead with a working model that puts that customer right at the forefront. Yeah, so that's exactly where where I wanted to kind of dig deeper here because that it's uh, to your point, like it's very easily said, but it's very <laughs> difficult to do it. Right? So, yeah. in, in your case and in, in, in the, your journey there, like uh, what what were kind of the biggest challenges in, in the organizations you've been to actually make that leap, like uh, make that uh, cultural shift? Like, uh, what are the the main yeah barriers and obstacles. So I'm sure I could spend the whole afternoon talking here. <laughs> so the challenge. I'll try to sum it up in a few that I think are really kind of meaningful of like these hurdles that you really kind of have to overcome. I think the first is that cultural shift that I mentioned, right? So when you're in this like project based and you're moving to product, it really does require a significant change in culture. And it's not just changing a process, right? It's not this business process in a in a flow kind of tool. It's really looking at ingrained attitudes, behaviors, and ways that the organization had been doing things in the past. And, you know, add in that resistance to change. Like there comes a lot of need for understanding of the shift and why you're doing it. And it comes out in a lot of kind of negative resistance. And it's not necessarily that, but it's a hurdle you have to overcome to say, I know that you're used to working this traditional, but like, how do we get you into this, you know, different role or in this different mindset really? So bringing people along, right? And then I think you take it one level down, like you're not going to take a project-led organization and completely undo that and bring in product managers who have worked at, you know, the people in the forefront. You're not going to bring in, be able to bring in that talent when you're doing this transition. So you really have to kind of coach and bring the team members that have been working in this different way into kind of this more modern working style. And I think developing those capabilities within the organization and training is hard, right? It takes time. And so you're left with this balance of I'm trying to deliver and I'm trying to new, learn a new working model. And I think there's an, an instant kind of change in I need to deliver and the culture is going to go down. So how do you kind of keep those two things and really move the organization forward, but keep that morale up and keep people really excited about it? I think that's I think that's one of the hardest pieces, right? You want to come out the other side with an organization that's so excited to work differently because they see all this benefits, but A to B takes a long time and is really hard, right? And I, you know, I'll build on that, I guess, with organizational complexity. 
you know, you think about, I've worked in brands, right, for a number of years. I've also worked outside at an agency. So I've kind of seen both sides of it. But, you know, the larger scale a company, the more processes, the more structure, the more hierarchies that may not lend themselves to something a little bit more nimble, a little bit more agile, right, a little bit faster to, to move to market. And so when you start to look at a working model that's more cross-functional, but you've been in more of a matrix kind of siloed org for years, it really makes it hard to go from this to this, right? And so you're kind of working across where you you could inflict change within just your group, just digital, just marketing, just operations, Wherever that digital team sat, I've been in a number of organizations where that constantly moves around. That's no longer the case. You're bringing five, six, seven different teams together to really bring something to market. And that's just such a huge change to the complex organizations to go from one structure to the other very quickly, right? So... Yeah, and you you brought you brought up uh, I think the the biggest change there like when you make those teams uh, across this kind of multidisciplinary right in the in the for for people that are not super familiar with the product management discipline here like with the product management kind of integrating like the mainly the three biggest pillars around you know, technology customer experience and and the business right so mm-hmm. Imagine that now you need your team to understand those three things equally, like what 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 that product means in terms of great value creation for the customers, what yeah. the technology that we're building it, you know, how this allows for that thing to happen and how that actually is actually paying back to our organization, right? So what's the value yeah. created for our organization? So, so it's a way more holistic uh, view of what we're doing, right? So it's l- way less functional and and deep, right, as you're explaining. Yeah. So, but to bring everybody to that same level of understanding, where at least the, the product managers, right, to that level of deep understanding of the the, the three of those um, disciplines, right, so it's it's a lot of time that we require, and no one is ready, right? Quite frankly, when we kind of organize those teams, when we ask, okay, who's going to be the product manager? Who has those three disciplines? Right. No one has, right? So, so what we do is actually kind of put together teams that will build that, you know, over time. I mean, we would even get stuck with like, what are the products? Like, what does a product look like, right? Is it customer facing? Is it internal user facing? Is it a platform level product, right? You kind of have all three, but at not, not at, at not one organization where this, where I was there during this change, did the products we picked at the very beginning and the structure of that stay after we kind of move through the transition, right? Those constantly evolved or we combine to, or we, and I think it's the beauty of the model, but when you think about this very risk averse, large scale organization trying to change, you're like, oops, like we didn't get it right. That shouldn't be a product. Like let's combine it with this other thing. And so having that authority or kind of that clout to say, this is the right model, but it's going to evolve over time. That's a hard that's a hard story to pitch and to kind of get that buy-in to be like, oh, whoops, like those weren't, that wasn't the right way to structure that. Like, we'll just move on, right? Like that it's so casual when you spent six months kind of pitching that this is the the way of the future. <laughs> and this is the way that you really kind of have to structure things. And then six months later you're saying, oh, well, we're going to make these changes to the process. So trying to combine that buy-in and this constantly learning and optimization within the model is a hard one, I think, for everybody to understand. It is, and in, in, in I think, I think, uh, but but we've been involved in all transformations like this with our clients for a long time, and and I think the the biggest uh, hurdle there is it, a very deep one, in my opinion, which is why we're doing this in the first place. Right? So so why we're kind of looking at to be agile and to respond faster to, uh, you know, to our client customer needs, right. In a different speed is because we don't know what they want or, or, uh, or their behaviors are changing at, at a speed where we actually we have to kind of constantly be chasing them right? and at the completely different speed. So, so there's a, an acknowledgement that we don't know what they want and we have to be, you know, constantly pursuing it. Right. 
So there's an amount of uncertainty outside our, our doors that's out there in the world, right? So we can, as Mike Tyson said, you can have a plan, but you know, <laughs> your plan doesn't last until the, your first punch in the mouth, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so the world changed with the internet, it, you know, it, it wrinkled, it, no, there's no way back, right? So there's just a, a different amount of uncertainty in, I think that the companies that are doing this right are the ones that actually understood the nature of uncertainty outside our doors. And they're okay with changing, you know, as long as for as it incorpor incorporates more res responsiveness and agility that, that, you know, it's, it's okay to recognize, you know, that we don't know what's outside our doors, you know, the, the, the world outside our doors are changing very fast and we're doing this and changing all the time because the time for the, the three year change management transformation plans, th this is gone, right? So uh, if you have a, a set in stone three year transformation plan, then you probably, <laughs> you're probably going to fail. <laughs> right. And how many times are you going to like abandon that plan or change leadership, right? And kind of pause or even start over in some cases, right? There's just so much to when you look at the actual working team level, right? To really get them and set them up for success. But then there's that managing outwards and upwards that equally is critical, right? But to your point, and what what a great one, like there's a lot of uncertainty. And when you really look at a structured organization with, you know, line item budgets that do not change, right? That's just it it's a hard narrative, right? It's a hard narrative to understand. And so much of a successful transformation is really about the relationships that you have internally and the trust that the organization has in you, in your team, kind of in the broader group that's really trying to do this because there's not a lot that's understood by every level of the organization. Right? And so how do you, you know, build that messaging, right? Get the training in place, get the people <laughs> to kind of move with you, you know, build the morale, like be their cheerleader deliver, start delivering in the model, right? And then also talk about the lessons learned and how maybe it wasn't all right. Like, but as hard as it can be when it happens, it is, I mean, like there's only been a few times in your career where you're like, wow, like this is why I do this, right? Like this is truly why you fight so hard, right? And when you have this organization or you're like, Sitting back in whatever you call it, organization, right? You know, you're running a safe model, which kind of pairs a little bit. You're doing more of a three amigos, whatever flavor of it you brought in your organization, right? You kind of sit in those planning sessions and you're like, wow, as a leader, I'm barely doing anything, right? Before you're like full court press, driving everyone through these sessions. I mean, that's success when your product team members and your organization is so embedded in the process and running so lean and kind of in their own models that you kick off with what you expect from a leadership perspective and you listen to the readout, right? You're, you've almost pushed yourself out of the day-to-day -day in the best way because you've empowered those product managers to be the CEOs, right? You've empowered those UX and designers to really understand the customer, the CI, the brand, and I don't necessarily care or think that there's a difference when you're you have the, some of those roles internal and when you have a great partner. I think it's more about allowing that team to really, you know, this old storming Norman like that they have really come and they've gelled and they've figured out the best way to work, regardless of kind of who writes their paycheck. <laughs> They're rallied around like, this is my product, this is my thing, and this is what my customers need. Like, that's why you go through all of the challenges and all of the hard work, because when that truly happens, like, you've not just set up your organization that you're working in to be successful, but, and of course, you want to keep everybody all the time and you never want anyone to leave or transition out of your team but they take that with them, right? And so you have taught a number of people how to move in a different manner 
And now they're able to kind of take that and also grow other people in a similar way, right? And kind of use that during their career to explain why this working model is so important, why it makes sense to move to this, and really where you can kind of bring success to an organization by focusing on that customer. Yeah, it, it's it's really rewarding right, to to go through that process and to see that you know the, the development and the growth uh, of, of the team right into those kind of more value creation uh, role. It's it's really cool. So which reminds me, like uh, the, you explained in, in the in the beginning, that you kind of picked a strategy which was to deliberately kind of uh, develop the people that you had right instead of uh, just going in the market and try to kind of uh, bring in you know ready to go uh, product managers like can you kind of walk us through a little bit of the, the rationale for that sure i think there's always the curious people right i use that word before to describe myself but i think when you have worked in the model and you kind of see how people are asking questions like i think it makes it easier to find those people organizationally regardless of kind of where they sat i mean it ha again it hasn't been that long but You had those business analysts of the world, right, asking one million questions <laughs> and logging everything in kind of their Excel file for, you know, BSR documents and, and more of what you're used to from like an old school methodology. But that type of, you know, questioning and, and asking and wanting to learn and grow, to me, that type of individual, while it may not always be a business analyst, right, that type of person, I think, lends itself very well. And they can come from the business side. They can come from IT. You know, I really looked at kind of two main roles that I ideally love to structure internally because I felt like they were such good growth opportunities for internal employees. And that was a product owner or manager, depending on kind of what type of structure the product needed, and the scrum master. The scrum master has their eye on everything. And so when you have someone who's been so used to like Microsoft project plans and, you know, Gantt charts and all of these things, like the scrum master structure lends itself well to somebody who has been used to working in more of a structured kind of linear project based model. Right. And so being able to identify, I would take somebody who, was willing to learn and excited over somebody who had 15 years of Scrum Master experience. Because I think one of the most important things when you are trying to find talent internally is really wanting to learn. And at times when the organization isn't quite ready to move so fast, when you bring in more experienced people who maybe have done this in a more structured manner elsewhere, right? There tends to be a lot of collisions internally about the best way to work. And with a transition, the company really has to find the best flavor at first of how they can move into the model to then refine it. And so for me, you know, growing and looking for people who were eager, who maybe wanted a change of pace, who still believed in the brand or the clients that we were working with, even agency side, that became really critical, right? And I would say that the best people that grew within organizations that I was in or being able to have that were people who didn't necessarily raise their hand, but who we kind of approached to say, I think that you would be great in this space. Like, are you interested? Like, no You know, it's okay if you're not, it's okay to say you don't want to raise your hand, but how do you kind of move through that? And so I really did a lot of um, moving people into the scrum master and then from the scrum master, moving them into product, right? Where you kind of would set a few people up front at the architect or the product manager level who maybe had worked a little bit in that or kind of had more formal training and then allow the team to kind of grow through there, but also bringing in your partner because at the end of the day, like you do get to work with development partners or IT organizations where they can bring to the table other organizations who have had success, right? Or the learnings there. And by, I think, doing an internal push, but also kind of having that as like 
a little bit like your parachute, right? Like, see, see, other people are doing it. Like they'll tell us about it. (laughs) Pairing those two together, I think, helps us be more successful or move farther into the model uh, when we would kind of hit a plateau or a little road bump. And we would say, oh, like, what could we be doing differently? Like, let's bust this off. And so, you know, having those key partners in place uh, really helps kind of accelerate the change at, at different points because you could only do so much internal with what you knew or trying to explain how you had done things before. You really had to kind of pair the two for that acceleration. Yeah, I really love how you put it because that that's what we've seen in, very, in, in all our clients that were successful doing this. So kind of they they used us or other people that they brought in as role models. Or so like, hey, you see that the, so you create you create a reference, right? So so, so people you, people cannot back out. Like, hey, this is working. Let's keep keep pushing, keep power exactly. through it. We you see that there's it's, that there, it's possible, right? So, yeah. but to scale. You need to kind of a uh, you know to create that challenge that everybody has to move, right? So that, and that's what I think it's beautiful in in your example because when you kind of start doing getting you know the people that we think can you know can be right for that position, and kind of a uh, empower them to kind of go and learn and, and perform it and grow into a different role, that sets an example for the rest of the organization because in the end of the day everybody has to change their minds and change the way they work. So when you show that's possible, like if someone did it. It sets a it sets an example in a track record for hey, the a hey, that it's possible. You know, you see so and so, you see Mary and John, they did it. So so can you? And the you know, so you kind of you start setting you know like the the you know the 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 whole thing in motion. So people can okay, it's possible. It's better, right? So the the other part part of it is it has to be better, right? So it's not only kind of the different way to work that you know it's more painful or it's just more work. It's, like, it's actually it's actually better, right? So look at those how those people are doing. And then During my time at Audi, I had an IT manager who it was like known that I would poach his role, which really was helping us kind of more at the scrum level. And I would move them over to product. And at some point, he just jokingly would be like, how about you just sit in the interview, but commit to me that you will give them one year, like let them learn <laughs> the IT side of things before you kind of take them, but it's your job to help me backfill because you keep taking them, right? And they were some of the more successful. And I think successful product managers is a is a tough thing to say, right? But I think they really acted as, you know, those mini CEOs, right? They really grasped the kind of, but they also saw it from both sides, right? They didn't just come in from a business lens and say like customer, customer, customer. It's like, okay, but customer and changing legacy system and, you know, doing things with access to more data and tracking things better. Like it really, I think, helped make them more well-rounded and really think about all of the pieces of what goes into building a good product because they had hands-on experience on the IT side prior to kind of making the jump to the business side. And not everyone is going to be successful with that type of jump. And I've had people who are started on the business side and went over to the IT side because they really wanted a little bit more of a narrow focus for the best reason. They felt like that's where they really could add the value and they didn't want to focus on that broad thing. And I think it's important to remember like there's roles for many different people in this model, right? It's not a one size fits all. There's different levels of products. There's different types of customers. Like it truly does lend itself the best to evolve within an organization because you have people who are so skilled in the background of the product, the brand, like they bring so much to the table, but what's coachable and what's teachable is the working model. You can't, you know, teach 20 years of automotive experience or you can't teach 15 years of someone being in hospitality and actually working at a front desk and moving up to corporate, right? That's so valuable to keep, but it's about finding the team that works together the best and bringing all of those people to the table regardless of title and level and all those things and really harness them around what 
can we do for the customer in this space that you're focusing on at this time? Yeah, but 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 it's it's it creates a an environment that is more conducive to that collaboration, right? When you kind of orient towards the customer, it's less about you know what what am I doing in my function, what you're doing in your functions, less about you know finger pointing. It's like a how we create more value for for the customer, which is this external entity that we everybody that we both or everybody here serves, right? So, yeah, exactly. and it's kind of easier to align around that. And, and when we empower the team to actually make those decisions, then, then it's again, easier to kind of, to have that collaboration going. Right. So yeah, yeah, that's, that's the beauty of the model that kind of in the end creates, you know, more value with more agility. Right. So, so what, 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 uh, any, any other kind of, uh, tactics or, 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 or strategies that you use to kind of, uh, to move the mindset of the people and uh, you, you mentioned a little bit of, if I, if I got it right. Yeah. It didn't start like a big bang type of transformation, trying to kind of teach everybody. Like, do you, you kind of start in some pockets and then kind of a, sh kind of let them grow and, and show some results before kind of a making it a kind of more standardized way of working? Like, how, how, do you, how do you go about it? So I have found more success on like the incremental, right, process changes, right? Maybe not everything moving at once into it. Maybe not staffing everything in a full standing kind of product team, right? But I do think the one thing that's important if you are starting to look at it as a more kind of incremental rollout or kind of a timed approach is you still have to have the narrative up front of why this is important, why it's going to be better, and what is it really going to bring to the organization. And I think I learned a lot during my time at Marriott, like I got the funding, we got a team room, like we had everything, but you know what, we acted like like a little bit like a groundhog, like we come up and we, oh, look what we delivered. And then we go back down. And I think, you know, at that point in my career, maybe I didn't focus as much of the product marketing aspect and not the product marketing of the product, but actually of the change and of the process improvements and what we were doing. Right. And so I do think there has to be kind of a, like, of course you want to give the team autonomy, but how do you bring what they're working on and how they're working and, you know, how many more stories they're finishing or how many more things they're getting out in a release or how much more often they're releasing, right? Even looking at not bundling up a monthly release is a huge change for an organization that was in more of a product um, or a project-led culture. Uh, and so I think there really is kind of a balance. But the one thing I will say, and I think it it's been an interesting learning over the history because, you know, I've been in tech, I've been in kind of more manufacturing, right? And, and a little bit more development led kind of heavy organizations. And I think that there's two camps about this and that's really like feelings at work, right? And it's so black and white, like there's no room for feelings. There's no room for that. But I think where I have seen organizations be more successful is when it's been led by a leader who understands and has empathy and emotional intelligence. It is easy to explain a new process and tell everyone to do it. It is another thing to validate people's emotions, talk through their concerns, right? You're not like you almost become half of a PR role where you're really tied to the organization, right? Therapist, but you're also kind of leading from a, I know this is going to work from a digital perspective. And I think when you foster that, you know, culture of empathy and kind of that safety where people feel comfortable expressing their feelings and concern, it takes on a different connotation than a very like negative, just constantly getting negative feedback about something, right? But you really have to open up, open yourself up to be available, to be there for people, right? To lean into what they're kind of feeling. You might not agree, but their feelings are valid and they have a they have a point in the process where getting them to come along with you is really important and people work differently. And so I think if you provide support and resources that help employees cope with 
emotional impacts of the change, I think that makes the transition more powerful and faster and more successful. But I do truly think that there are two camps with that where it's easier to go back to brick and mortar and basic training and say, this is how we do things. I think frameworks are important. And I think it's important that teams work in similar manners. But to me, bringing in that empathy and being a leader who cares about the people changing becomes really critical to the success of whether this is actually going to take off within an organization. And I think as soon as people feel not heard or kind of start to shut down because this is this is what I have to do, so I'm just going to do it, you're not going to get the value out of the model, right? You want people engaged. You want them to be just as excited about the customer and what they're delivering as the organization should be. And so I think to me, the only way to do that is really pairing the knowledge in the space of the model and the emotional intelligence to really be the face and be open and accountable to how people get there, right? And how they feel about getting there. I I love that, Amanda. Like, Mm -hmm. because, and you just can't provide that type of uh, support for people in a large scale, right? You have to start small and gradual, like, because you, you just can't, can be for, there for everyone at, with that intensity, right? Like, so that's like, I guess, if you put this in like, a, this is uh, the, the critical part of the process, that's, that explains how, why it actually has to be, you know, gradual, because, you know, there's just an amount of people that you can support at the same time and go through that at the same time, right? So. Yeah. And then in, in, in the end, that scales by itself. Like once, once you've been through that with a couple of people, they they can be that those coaches and support for other people, right? So then it starts scaling like a pyramid scheme, right? Like in a good way. <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> but 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 the but that kind of a what what we see failing over and over again is actually transformational programs that are kind of don't take into account that safe space and that kind of needed support to go through this. Right? It's because that's not a not a new technique that you learn, right? So that's a, a mindset, a mindset shift. You're not going to acquire that just going to a two to three day training program and then reading a new job description created by a you know a fancy consulting company. And then okay, just just fly from the nest. Here we go. Yep. This is your job description. You been to the training. That's really like why, pushing why you not performing. Right. Right. <laughs> see you later. Like yeah, see you later. Yeah, just right. go fly. Yes. I mean, haven't you go? Haven't you gone through the 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 flight, the flight, the training? The, the, that's how you fly. Just go and fly. Right? And you're going to be right back to either working the old way, or working in such a hodgepodge that it's really hard to deliver anything because there's just no shared understanding. And, and the, just just to kind of a, maybe to kind of a, put a put the last last question there for you, like a. You've been through this process many times. Like, what, what, what the? How, how do you feel that for you, or you individually? Like, uh, what, what did you learn? How did, what, what did added to your, you know, uh, tool set? And, you know, how did you become a better leader after those, those programs, going through those, those experiences? Good question. I think I'll, I'll call it like customer centricity is paramount, right? I think when you're trying to move models and you're so focused on this a different structure and kind of doing that, right? You have to still stay in touch with your customer, right? It still has to be at the center. You're not just running all of these ceremonies and all of these different things to work in the model. You're doing that because iteratively, you're supposed to be learning more about your customer and putting them at the forefront. So I think at times, even though we were successful in what I would say like velocity and throughput on what we were delivering, I won't say it was always paired with, are those what the customer really, like, are those the features that customer really wants? Or are those still maybe features internally we're pushing at a corporate level and we're pushing it through the process and delivering more, but we we took our eye off the prize, right? We're not as in touch with that customer. And so I think you know, if I look at Audi on the dealer side, like looking at an internal customer, really getting out and talking to them, like it was so important, but it was also a constant need to get back out there and to keep touching base with them and to keep understanding, right? If you were 
interviewing them once a year and then developing for the rest of the year. Like <laughs> you're saying you're keeping them at the forefront, but you're not in the process, right? And so really kind of bringing in customer intercepts, getting out and shadowing, like that becomes really important. And I, I think the theme of this entire thing is leadership and culture matters, right? You just can't, you know, strong leadership is important, but I think it's strong leadership managing out and up becomes important. But ultimately, you have to have approval and accountability at the president and C-suite level to reinforce that as an organization, we are doing this, right? Organizations change, they reorg, new leadership comes in. It is important that that voice at that level stays consistent so that you don't abandon this kind of along the way, right? And then I think empowering employees becomes really, really critical. Yes, it is a leader's job to get the training, to get the organization structure, to get the funding. But at the end of the day, the model works for those teams that have that autonomy to really work and own and build something that matters. You coming in sideways constantly is not going to be helpful, right? It's actually going to hurt. Like then just does, mess around. Yeah, just because five other companies have something doesn't mean it necessarily makes sense in our digital ecosystem or in what we're kind of trying to deliver. And so I think you know, support that growth within your team, support them maintaining their autonomy, right? And really kind of be a partner with them, not necessarily kind of this overarching figure that's really kind of dictating what they need to do, when they need to change and how fast they need to do it, but really kind of, you know, being that partner to them that they can talk to, that they can talk about some of the failures, that they can, you know, run ideas past and you're really there to kind of support them, not check boxes, right? And lastly, I'll say it's hard, right? We talked about it a little earlier. It is hard. Like it's hard. It seems daunting. There's times that I've been years into things. What? Like this is just not going to work. And you kind of refocus and you like dig deep on why are we doing in this first place? Why does it matter? Why is it important? But it takes some time to be successful. And I think it's important to hear that. It's okay. It's not going to change overnight. It's going to be hard. But again, when it actually comes to life, it comes to fruition. It's amazing to see like, you did that, like you were at the table for that monumental change in an organization culture, in the way that they work, right? When you start hearing, you know, biggest reward, when you start hearing other people talk about this is how we work or this is how we do things, it's like, yes, like, <laughs> that is why we do things. Right? When you start to hear back what you have maybe been preaching and trying to coach on for years and you hear someone else almost even saying it back to you, like that's the reward. And that's kind of, I think, why no matter what you kind of keep going, but it's not for the faint of heart. Like it is a long, hard road and it can be daunting and you just need to keep going as a leader. Like you're on the right track. You're doing the right things. It's not going to happen like with the snap of a finger. So keep going, stay motivated and remember that you're the face that are motivating these people through the change. So they are going to read how you are feeling and how you are acting about the change. So, you know, be that mirror for them, but in the best way, in a positive way that really shows them and kind of leads them to that change versus, you know, being another voice that's maybe putting down what we're trying to do organizationally. I mean, if you're, if you're in the easy if it's easy, you're probably on the wrong track, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yes. There will be parts that should be easy along the way, but... Uh, I don't, the, end, the end is rewarding and it, it gets easy. Yes. It, it, you're right. It does get easier. So. Cool. Amanda, I can't, can't thank you enough. 
it's very, very, you know, very insightful and inspiring story. And, and uh, thank you so much for your kindness and generosity to share your, you know, wisdom with us here. Yeah. Really appreciate thank it. You. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.